Well, it's the second channel, and that can only mean one thing. And I don't know what it is. Let's get into the weeds! So, uh, since this is the second channel, um, that fan's running. It's gonna shut off in the next five minutes or so, but uh, I'm not bothering to turn it off beforehand. That's how much I care! No, I'm kidding. I do like having these discussions with you. Um, and today's discussion is one that I kind of, I don't know how I feel about this. And I'm pretty confident that it's not like we as a society are going down the wrong path, but I do think there's more to consider. Uh, so, as I'm sure most of you know, though it has been quite a while since I made a video on the topic, I am an electric vehicle enthusiast. I drive now a lot a Chevy Bolt, and officially my car is a Chevy Volt, uh, because they're both in the family and it's kind of complicated right now, but in any case, the Volt is technically my car, but I've been driving the Bolt a lot because um, it suits right now I'm doing more driving than anyone in the family. So for now, we've kind of traded cars for a little while, but anyway, I know electric cars, I know a lot about them, and I believe that they're a good thing. And one of the arguments that has been floating around out there from certain people, not everybody, but certain people, I used to think was pretty dumb, but it's starting to, it's starting to weigh on my head a little bit. And that is that currently the trend is to put more batteries into an EV, meaning it put more bigger bat or a bigger battery in it so we can go farther on one charge. Cool. That sounds great. But is it? And uh, it's reminding me of arguments that we've had in the past regarding the Chevy Volt. Now, so let's think about waste here. The argument is if you're only driving typically 50 miles a day, why do you have a car with a 300 mile battery? Your battery's six times larger than it needs to be. You're hauling around all that weight for no reason. Now, if you rewind to like 2011, there were people who had Nissan Leafs who would then confront people with Chevy Volts and they would say, why do you haul around that internal combustion engine and gas tank with you when you're only driving 20 miles a day? So this is a thing that has been a thing in the EV space for a while. And, you know, as time has gone on, I'm not one who thinks of building lithium ion batteries as being a terrible thing. I don't think the environmental impact is nearly as bad as continuing to burn fossil fuels, particularly because the batteries can be recycled at the end of their life, which you cannot do with petroleum products because once they're burned, they're in the atmosphere and then we're done. And just to be clear, because a lot of people, I'm going to get ahead of you in the comments because this is going to attract a lot of people saying some questionable, nasty things because they don't like electric cars. The whole reason we are switching to them is because they are energy agnostic. They can run from nuclear power, they can run from solar power, wind power, anything. So we don't have to keep extracting resources to make these run. We do have to extract a lot of resources up front to build the thing, but if you had a solar array on your roof and some way to store the day's energy so you can put it in your car when you're back home, or better yet, there are solar panels at your workplace and you're able to charge from them, but that's a little lofty goal right now. But in any case, it is possible to fuel an electric car with zero environmental impact for probably a decade at least before the battery becomes unusable. But anyway, I'm already like way off track. So the Chevy Volt concept is dead. GM discontinued the Volt in February, and I'm sure there are probably some new ones still for sale on dealer lots, but it's dead. And they've gone hardcore into full EVs and have kind of axed the plug-in hybrid, which is a thorn in my side because I don't consider the Volt to be a plug-in hybrid because it is the other cars that are called plug-in hybrids are often nothing like the Volt in terms of either their range or how they function, but that's another thing. So basically, my question here is, is the death of the Chevy Volt concept a good thing? So let's rewind to when it was first created. Um, and 
I'm going to throw the bone to the... So this is an annoying thing about talking about electric cars is there is, there are, there is still tribalism like there is with any car brand. And there's also a sense of righteousness which bugs the crap out of me. So I'm gonna throw a bone to you people that have that sense of righteousness and say, you're right. It was the Tesla Roadster that convinced GM to produce the Chevy Volt. Why does that matter? Like, it doesn't prove that Tesla is, it, it just, it bothers me. It's, it's a good fact to know. It's not something you can deny, but it's also like, it doesn't prove anything. It doesn't mean that Tesla is a better company because their actions convinced another company to do something else. Now, obviously, GM has some, you know, they still make giant trucks and stuff, so it's not like they're all in on EVs. But my point is, just let's not start talking about the past as reasons why we should or should not support the actions of one company because, <sighs> anyway. I just get a little fed up with that righteousness. So if, if, if you understand where I'm coming from, cool. If you don't, that's also cool. So if we go back to 2010, GM wanted to produce something like an electric car. And it was decided that, I believe the story is that Bob Lutz, Lutz, I think he wanted it to be fully electric, but then his bosses were like, that's not feasible. It's going to be so expensive because remember, this was 2010. So, well, this is more like 2006 when everything was starting to get rolling, but the first Volt came out in 2010. So batteries were still very, very expensive. So what they decided to do was they decided to develop a hybrid powertrain, which can also function without the engine at all. And so they built a battery pack designed to meet the daily commute needs of the 80th percentile of the population. And then that's what the Volt is. It's an electric vehicle that happens to also have an engine in it, so that way if you need to exceed its range, it's not a problem at all. So, base, so to boil it down into a sentence, GM tried to make a vehicle which could become feasibly electric with the smallest battery pack size possible. And at that time, it was precisely because of cost, because if they, you know, the the Gen 1 Volt's battery pack, I believe, was estimated to cost something like $15,000 originally because it was like, you know, pioneering tech. And so they didn't have, they were trying to make this a mass market appeal car. And so obviously they're not going to push, you know, they're not going to try to put a 40 kilowatt hour battery pack in it and sell it for $60,000 because already what whatever the first selling point was, was quite high. But that's basically the entire theory of the Volt, is how can we make an electric, a feasibly electric car with the smallest battery possible that doesn't mean the car is useless past that small range. So that was what the Volt tried to do. Now, fast forward to 2019. As batteries have become cheaper, we're not, in the US anyway, seeing many cars, many electric cars, that are that much cheaper because we're not making cheaper battery packs, we're making bigger battery packs. So we're, we're using the same amount of money to make bigger battery packs. So if you look at, for instance, the Nissan Leaf, the base model of the Nissan Leaf starts at $30,000, and now it has a 40 kilowatt hour battery pack, which is about double what the first Leaf was, a little more than double. So we're no longer bothering to sell 80 mile range EVs because there's not much of a point. But my the catch is, is that correct? Is that what we should be thinking about? And could that potentially be wasteful? So the people who manage to live their lives with low range EVs, like the original Leaf or the Renault Zoe, is it Zoe or Zoe? I don't know, I've never heard that pronounced. They often say, why bother paying for a big battery that you only use a few times a year? Why bother carrying that weight around with you using and paying for that thing which you're rarely gonna use? which again mirrors the complaint that was put upon the Volt, which was why bother carrying an engine around with you if you're not going to use it that often? And the answer to both of those questions is because sometimes I need to go farther than the car can take me. And so, or sometimes I need to go farther than I do on an average day and I don't want to have another car to satisfy those needs. I only want one vehicle. 
So the question becomes, what is a smarter use of resources? Is putting in perhaps triple the size battery that we may typically need smarter? Or instead, should we just sacrifice a pure EV to put in an internal combustion engine to cover those, you know, those relatively rare instances of needing more range? So, and now because battery packs are cheaper, we could conceivably make a car like a Volt with something like an 80 or 100 mile EV range, which could satisfy 99% of all trips traveled, and then it would still have an engine to take over those extra, you know, if you wanted to go on a road trip, you'd have an engine. And by the way, just hopefully, if you haven't started writing, yelling at me in the comments for how anti-Tesla I am, I just want to say, back in the day, there were these really smug Volt owners who would say on forums things like, oh, you guys have your superchargers? Well, my car carries around a supercharger that I can just refuel at any gas station everywhere, so how about that? So it's smugness writ large that bothers me. Those Volt owners were so, they had their heads in the clouds. It's a completely different idea. Shut up. Anyway, so again, what, what is a smarter use of resources? Putting in a smaller battery and sacrificing a pure battery electric vehicle to have an engine and its support components, or putting in per perhaps triple the size battery that you might need, so that way you can more feasibly use it as one, you know, as your only car. And the answer is, I don't know. But the reason why I wanted to, I started these thoughts on Twitter was mainly because there is a misconception about the Volt and there are still people and not to single someone out, but there was a discussion I had on Twitter who don't get it. And it's like this car has existed for a decade practically and they still don't get the concept because it's, it's hard to explain. And that's what, you know, people got mad at GM for not effectively marketing the car. It's a hard car to explain. And, you know, because of the dealership model, the dealers weren't really great at explaining it to people either. So the people who understood the car, the people who it clicked to, went to the dealership and bought one, are thrilled with it. I love the thing. It's been completely reliable. It's incredibly comfortable. And it manages to fill a need in such an ideal way using technology from 10 years ago. But anyway, I'm, digress I'm digressing a little bit. What I wanted to say was the Volt, for those of you, for those that do understand the Volt concept, they, of they often don't understand exactly how it works. And what I was planning on doing was making this, and I, I, I was planning on making a video about it and then transitioning into should we be abandoning this concept. I've since, I may still make a video on the Volt because it's very interesting. And I would, I do wish people understood it a little better because I think a very common imagination of the car is people imagine it as both a, uh, an electric car and a gas powered car. So in their head, they're thinking of this very complicated car that has an electric drivetrain and a gasoline drivetrain. And when the battery is discharged, then the car switches to a completely different drivetrain. No, that's not what happens. The car is basically a hybrid, but it has bigger motors so that way it can operate without, you know, it can actually accelerate, get to speed and behave as a normal car. And it has a much larger battery pack. But the key is, unlike other hybrids, if you took out the engine, the car would operate fine. The Volt is an electric car first. The engine is only doing work to provide most of the time electricity to the car after the battery has been depleted. And it's not like there's another system going on. It's actually pretty freaking remarkable and seamless and foolproof because and th this, this is the heart of my argument, and I'm, I'm really bad at just talking about stuff, so if you... Cool. So if you watch this channel, and uh, hopefully you know that, uh, but the thing that... People imagine the Volt as this incredibly complicated thing, but if you took out its engine and the motor drive unit, 
you would find that it looks exactly like the engine and transmission of any car. It looks like, you know, a Civic with an automatic transmission, a Corolla of any four cylinder bolted to a transmission is what it looks like. It's just the transmission has six orange cables coming out of it going to the Voltec drive unit. Because the Voltec drive unit is literally a transmission. It's designed to bolt up to an engine, but that engine might as well not be there unless you are out of battery range. And that's, and the thing is, the drive unit itself is so much simpler than an automatic transmission. And this is what I think people, this is where I think the misconception comes from, is they, they cannot imagine an, an electric car that can also run on gasoline as being simpler than a conventional car but it is because there's there aren't multiple gears. So basically, and I, I left the white, this is the remnants of the previous video. I left the whiteboard out here to draw a little diagram for you. I'm a great artist. So this, as I said, I mean, this is a simplified diagram, but if you're looking at the engine and drive unit of a Volt, it looks like an engine and transmission because it's designed to fit into a Chevy Cruze. Cause you gotta remember the Volt is really a Cruze in disguise, but you have a four cylinder engine but again, this is not doing anything if the car has any charge, unless you either ask it to, or it's below 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Fahrenheit, because it will run the engine to provide heat, which I'm not gonna get into that yet, because actually that's, you can argue is either bad or good. I have mixed feelings about it, but anyway, there are only motor, essentially there's motor generator A, motor generator B, a planetary gear set and three clutch packs. That's what I drew in red. That's it, okay? There are only three things that actually engage and disengage in this transmission. Motor generator A is smaller. Motor generator B is the bigger one and it is what generally propels the car, especially under heavy acceleration. And there is a clutch pack which can connect A to the engine, a clutch pack which can connect A to B and in that case they're connected through the planetary gear set and they can actually work almost like a three-speed transmission so the Volt actually has underdrive direct drive and overdrive uh, which a lot of EVs don't have and um, with efficiency advances it's not really like that's super important but then there's another clutch pack basically just to connect the transmission to the wheels and those three don't quote me on that because I think it's a little more complicated than that but Basically, there's only three clutch packs in this car. And if the car has any battery power at all, this clutch pack connecting motor generator A to the engine is disengaged. So this engine does nothing at all. And so there are four operating modes. And if you wanna learn more about this, I would rec highly recommend this video from the Weber Automotive, Weber University in Utah, I think. It's great, and I was gonna reference this, and this is where I got much of the information. However, just to let you know, he made an error which he corrected in the description, and I'm going off of the description. So, mode one is B does everything. The wheels are basically connected to B, A is sitting pretty. Mode two is A and B are then connected together, and it can provide power either through A or B or both. And this gives it more potential, um, more different gearing ratios, etc and is more efficient. So generally it's gonna use big motor B when you're accelerating, and if you're cruising, it will use A and B together in whatever is the most efficient combination. That's mode one and two. That's the EV modes. So when it's working in an EV, A and B do all the work, the engine sits here doing nothing at all. The car has an electric uh, air conditioning compressor, electric power steering, the engine is not required for anything at all. And that is why I get a little annoyed when people keep calling this a hybrid because the engine sits here doing nothing most of the time. Then when your battery is depleted, motor A and B get separated and then A gets connected to the engine. So this clutch pack here connects A to the engine. Initially, A will spin the engine to start it. Then the engine is running and after a brief warm up period, then the engine starts turning A. And this is mode three. So now the engine is turning motor generator A, which generates electricity to power motor generator B. And this is a series hybrid. So in mode three, the engine is spinning a generator to generate electricity to move the car from the other motor. 
And mode three is, like I said, it's a series hybrid. And in this configuration, they would still call this an electric vehicle that has a range extender. But then there's mode four. Mode four connects basically all the clutch packs on. So A is connected to B like it is in mode two, meaning that there, and because B is connected to the wheels, the engine does power the wheels at high speeds. It only does it at high speeds because it doesn't have gear ratios and that's the only speed that it can feasibly move the wheels. But because of this, the Volt is not considered an extended range electric vehicle, it's considered a plug-in hybrid. Even though, functionally, it's exactly the same as something like a BMW i3 Rex, it just has a smaller engine and a bigger gas tank. It drives me insane that this technicality makes the car something that it's not. Because if you compare it to something like the Honda Clarity, uh, the Honda Clarity is very close to being a Volt, but it's my understanding that the engine will still start if you floor it or under other circumstances where it needs more power. The engine on the Volt does not start, period, unless it, either you ask it to, you're out of battery range, or it's really cold. Because it will, like I said, it will run the engine because it's going to heat it up to provide extra heat for the car, and then just spinning motor generator A provides electricity to turn on the cabin heater too. And like I said, it, it's up for debate whether or not that's smart. Um, but the, the, it just boggles my mind that the Volt gets disqualified as being considered an electric vehicle that has a range extender because in mode four, the engine is technically powering the wheels. And the reason why it's annoying is because that's the most efficient thing. You lose energy when you convert mechanical energy to electrical energy and then electrical energy back into mechanical energy. So mode three, where A is running as a generator for B, isn't that efficient. And that's why the first gen Volt gas mileage is not impressive at all. And that's probably part of why it, you know, it just never, it needed refinement because what GM tried to do was they tried to make a hybrid powertrain that could conceivably also be an electric car, which they did. It works. It works super well. The problem is that it's not super efficient running on gas because you have those energy conversion losses. At highway speeds, it's better because again, you do have the engine coupled to the wheels to some extent, but it's not the greatest. For the Gen 2 Volt, they got it. So the Gen 1 Volt gets 35 city, 40 highway when running on gas. So like a little bit better than just a regular car of the same size. The Gen 2 Volt gets, I think, like 45, 43. So it's closer to a hybrid, but like a Prius is always more efficient than a Volt because on gas, because trying to do this with two big motors and using the engine to spin a generator just isn't as efficient. But the point, going back to what I was making earlier, the, the, the thing to consider is, it is this potential... Well, the, th the thing to remember is this is not complicated. This is not an automatic trans. This is nothing like an automatic transmission with all of its clutch packs, different gear sets to make now eight or 10 different gear ratios. And it's not a CVT either. It's not like a, you know, a, a Toyota hybrid system, which has a CVT in it. It's literally just two motors and generators, three clutch packs, a planetary gear, which I didn't show, a planetary gear set, and then a final drive gear set. And that's essentially it. It's cleverly packaged, it works, and it, it works really well. One of the fun little facts about this is because all of these components can be spun, you know, when it has to, uh, whenever any of these clutch packs have to engage, the computer will match the speeds of the motor. So that way there's basically no wear on the clutch pack at all. So say A needs to start the engine, right? Well, when A couples itself to the engine, it stops first. It comes to a stop, couples itself to the engine, then starts up again. When A and B need to couple to each other to switch to either mode four or more, or mode two, it will speed up the motor so that way they're matched before it engages. And I love, it's, it's interesting because now that I've learned how the car works, you can actually feel it doing these things. It's really, really subtle, but it, it explains a little better what exactly is happening. So if for nothing else in this video, I hope you learned a little bit about the Chevy Volt and how it's not this extraordinarily complicated engineering feat. It's basically a hybrid that has a bigger motor and a bigger battery. 
And while it's not as efficient at being a hybrid as something like a Prius, it can be an EV. It is an EV when it has any charge. And it just drives me a little crazy because a lot of people either don't understand this or they think that the car is vastly complicated. So uh, I need to restart the camera because I'm running out of time and then I have a few things to wrap up. So the crux of the issue is, is it worth carrying this around instead of a triple, a three times as big battery? I, I still don't know. My gut says maybe, but there's other stuff to consider because the engine requires, you know, a fuel tank, a catalytic converter, uh, evaporative emissions equipment, and, you know, all the other stuff that an engine needs, crankshaft position sensors and oil pump and all that stuff. It's made a little... Like, when people worry about the reliability of the Volt, first of all, I would say... By and large, it's been pretty reliable, and I think a large part of that is the engine doesn't run a lot. If you if you were to just look at this engine, like um, I think on my Volt, it's got 72,000 miles on it now. The engine was only running for about 14,000 of those miles. So the majority of the time, the engine was off. So yeah, it's going to wear, but also the engine will probably outlast the car because it is uh it, it doesn't run a lot and the other thing i'd like to point out is that people freak out about that and they think that oh well the, there's gonna get bad gas in the lines they thought of that the car has software in it where if you haven't run the engine for six weeks it runs it for about five minutes it considers it calls it maintenance mode and then it won't do it again for another six weeks and if you haven't used any gas in a year it will basically say your gas is stale you need to use it, and so it will just force you to run on gas until you empty that tank and then ask you to fill it up again. So there have been no issues with stale gas. And getting off topic a little bit, the first gen Volt supposedly requires premium, which I highly doubt to be the case because the second gen Volt does not require premium and it has a higher compression ratio engine. I think they said, I think they required premium because they thought it would store better and they just were kind of afraid of putting regular and leaded in the tank. I'll tell you, I've done it many times. The car was fine. Not saying you should, but I think the requirement for premium is BS. So, so going back to the question at hand, what, what is a better use of resources is, is the thing I'm getting at. Batteries are getting cheaper to make, sure. But if you consider that you could build three cars like the Volt, maybe even four using the same cost of batteries than like a long range Tesla, then things start to seem a little different. And then you also have to consider that, well, if batteries are just going to keep getting cheaper, then that cost, you know, the crossover point keeps moving. So what really is the best? And again, I don't know, but I, I, I am thinking about it because the loss of the Volt concept to me seems at the same time logical and also kind of bad because it has a lot of, it has a lot of real world benefits one of the biggest ones is that it's like an ev with training wheels so i was the first one in the family to get an electric car of any sort and you know i quickly learned that 38 miles of range sounds like you're going to be using the engine all the time, but I wasn't. You know, my first, when I had the car, I didn't have a very long commute, but, um, you know, it was basically, I'd get to work and back, and it would still have 10 or 12 miles of range. And at that point, I think my round trip commute was like 24 miles. So even in winter, the engine might barely start, uh, but usually it wouldn't. And the other thing is, you know, the Volt becomes an electric car charging off a regular outlet overnight. You know, you don't... And I made videos about this earlier because of that very fact. It's like level one charging actually does a lot more than you think because you don't drive that much on any given basis. But but if you have, you know, if you ever want to learn anything about EV, and I have, I have other EV related, I want to do a uh, charging glossary of sorts, but... Um, yeah, anybody, anybody have any questions about either the Bolt or Volt, feel free to ask me because I can answer them. Um, but 
my last, I have two last two things to add. Uh, people who want to drive electric but need to go on long distance regularly either need to wait for more faster DC fast charging because as much as I, and this is the thing, I am totally willing to wait a half hour to charge my car, but a lot of people are not. And there's going to be a lot of people probably in the comments of this video that are going to talk about that very thing. So the question then becomes, they, they either need to wait, those particular people either need to wait for DC fast charging to get much better, which I think it will, but I couldn't tell you how quickly that's going to happen, or they need to have another car. And the whole point of the Volt is to allow one vehicle to do both things, to be a daily electric vehicle and a road trip capable vehicle seamlessly. And the problem is it's just a really hard concept to explain. And while you don't have to put a lot of thought into the car, it's best if you do. And uh, some people just don't want to deal with that. I, th I'm putting this in later because I forgot to add this point. The other thing to consider is, would you be quiet? The other thing to consider is that if you have, if a car like a Volt that had an 80 or 100 mile range was the norm, that means infrastructure to charge the cars becomes less critical. So basically like the Tesla supercharger network and whatever other DC fast charging networks that exist or are about to exist have to be there to make a long range car possible to go coast to coast, which is fine. But if you had a car with a 100 mile range that also had an engine, then, you know, for 360 days of the year, you just would probably never have a need to go to anything like a supercharger. And then for the four or five other days of the year, you just stop at the gas stations that already exist. I'm not happy with burning more gas, but I am seriously questioning what would have a greater impact sooner. Should we wait for more long range cars and have more long range infrastructure or would it make sense to push out a larger number of short range cars for that are cheaper that do need gasoline to go long distances? Because the actual manufacturing cost of each car is almost certainly going to be less and cost, I mean emissions, is almost certainly going to be less for a car like that. And if the gasoline part is a 1% of the time situation, then yeah, you are burning some fossil fuels, but if you look over the life of the car, it's possible that it's actually better. I haven't, you know, I don't know if anyone's done any studies like this, but you know, it's true. Like engineering explained just did, uh, well, not just did, but he did a video about the environmental costs of um, an EV and that they recoup themselves pretty quickly, which I'm not denying, but I am saying that like, there definitely is a higher impact of making a car with a really big battery. So, is it worth sacrificing a little bit of uh, long-term emissions to whittle away at the upfront emissions? It might be, I don't know. I have a feeling it's not because we are going headfirst into big battery EVs, but it still just makes me wonder. I'm gonna end by saying that I don't think Teslas and other long range cars are bad. That's not what I'm saying because I, I agree that batteries are getting much cheaper very quickly, and who knows how long it's gonna be before this whole thought experiment makes no sense at all. It might not even make sense at all today. I don't think that's the case because when you consider that you can still get cheap cars new for like, you know, under 15,000, I can't imagine the drivetrain parts of that car cost more than three or $4,000. You gotta remember, the bulk of the car is not the drivetrain, it's the, the car. It's the metal body, it's the seats, it's the trim, it's the glass, it's the sensors and everything. So yes, an electric car is simpler because you know it doesn't have a gas tank. You can basically just make a battery on a skateboard, put the motor wherever you want, and boom, it's a car. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have all the other parts that cars have. It still has a suspension, it still has sensors, switches, latches, all the other stuff, and you know. I'm not trying to throw shade at Tesla, but it's like, it's not like Teslas have been, everybody buys a Tesla, nothing ever goes wrong with it. Stuff goes wrong with the cars. It's just, they're cars. It's not, the engine is one small part. But 
I want to I want to end by saying that and I probably said I want to end a bunch of times. I'm on the EV side. I really am. And there was a thing I did and I I cannot I cannot for the life of me like remember exactly where this happened or when, but I was arguing with someone about how infrequent the need for long distance travel is. And he was uh, saying something like, um, because it was it was a matter of like where you live is your mindset of what's normal. So he said something about it's normal to drive 300 miles a day in his neighborhood or because I think he was he was in a rural area and he needed to drive a lot. And I said, well, you're you're very much an outlier for the general population. And he didn't believe he was because his idea of normal is people have to drive three or four hours a day just to, you know, be a human where they live. And I was like, that's you're fine living that life. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but I'm just saying you don't represent who everybody is. And he would not let up. He was basically just like, no, you're wrong. More people need to drive more than you think. So what I did was I went to cars.com and I looked at all cars for sale that were like 2013 or newer. And then I wanted to see how many of them had. No, I only looked at one model year, right? I looked at like all 2014 cars and then I filtered it to see how many had 400,000 miles on it. Cause that's basically what he was saying. He was saying in his area, it's normal for someone to buy a car and put 80,000 miles a year on it. So I wanted to see how many cars are actually of, of all the cars for sale on cars.com right now of that model year meet or exceed that range. And it was like a half of a percent, something like 10 cars total. And so I said, this is the reality. People don't drive that much. There are people who need to drive that much. I'm not saying you don't exist, but I'm saying, stop it. But I am saying that, you know, it's, it's really frustrating that you can't see that your life is different from the majority of other people's lives. And like, that's getting into fun topics about humanity and how we perceive each other, which I don't want to get into right now because already it's really annoying right now. Uh, but anyway, I'll end it here. Just remember, the Volt is not that complicated. There's weeds everywhere. We should get into them. And just because one thing seems like it makes sense doesn't mean it's the be-all end-all.